I'm really, really happy to welcome uh, this panel of speakers. There's still one speaker missing. He will be joining us at some point, Solomon. We hope that he didn't have any technical problems like we had here today. Uh, so I would like to welcome uh, Fazila, Pat, Alex, and uh, Renuka today uh, to our panel to talk about witness report series, to talk about our own um, experiences as witnesses of, of climate change and community climate action. So we will be speaking from our own experience. We'll be telling stories uh, from place and from experience. Um, today, um, we are here in Scotland, in Newton Grange, south of Edinburgh, during COP26. Uh, there's lots uh, happening here, especially in Glasgow, but I'm very happy that for us who couldn't make it to Glasgow today, um, or who wanted to um, see uh, something something different. There's a lot of marches, a lot of things going on, but I'm really, really happy for us uh, to, to be gathered here today during the COP to listen to, to the stories. So we will be starting from the farthest place. So um, even though Fazila is not uh, in Kenya at the moment, she will be bringing um, a perspective from from Kenya. Fazila is one of the co-authors of Climate Adaptations, a book that was published by Artbound Foundation, and she will be bringing her as her story, her experience, um, and in the end of all the speakers we will have some questions, but the panel will also have questions for each other. So Fazila, off to you. Hi everyone, it's, it's great to be here. My name is Fazila Mubarak. Um, I was born in Kenya, I've lived in Kenya most of my life. Um, I've been living in London for about uh, two years right now. And um, I've been volunteering as a wildlife volunteer for the past um, about eight years. And that led me going into activism. So what, I, what happened is I started um, during the, there was a huge poaching uh, crisis of elephants going on around 2013. And I wanted to do something to help with, the, with it. And at that time, I tried to apply to so many organizations if I could volunteer, but I, I just didn't get any chance because in Kenya, the conservation arena is, is really white dominated. And me being a person who wears a hijab and being a person of color, I tried to apply in so many organizations, but it was really difficult to get in. And I was lucky that I um, came for the Wild Kenya. They agreed to me which is again, not um, it's led by uh, the Asian community in Kenya and they agreed to come and, and take me you know, on board. And during, just from my first trip, I just got the first hand account of how important communities are in conserving the biodiversity of, of a land. And then um, I started, started slowly seeing the effects of you know charcoal degradation that's happening in the environment which is linked to poverty and um in like around 2016 we started seeing this droughts that were happening the the prolonged the season the dry seasons were getting so prolonged and um the place i used to volunteer is in the savo conservation area and we have so much wildlife over there we have huge elephants they're so beautiful and we have buffaloes but you know what was happening in the dry season the water holes were drying out and the wildlife would go into the communities that i'd volunteered in and it was causing like havoc because they would go and destroy farms and um you know even cause injuries so we, we tried uh, seeing what, what ways we could do to help the wildlife over there so they wouldn't go and affect the communities and then in 2017 um another drought came in you know, again, the dry season got so prolonged, all the water holes started drying out. And this time the crisis um, was in Kenya's north coast. It's, it's a place called Lamu, which is so wild and it's still so pristine. And um, the thing with Lamu is that, you know, we don't have packs of land that, you know, this is a national park and this is where the community lives. So you just have, wilderness with communities living you know all around that they've literally lived like that for like hundreds of lives and that's been the way our way of life as africans you know but then what was happening now the water holes were drying out so again the same story the wildlife was coming into community lands and causing havoc you know people are getting injured crops are being destroyed 
and you know you can imagine people farmers who have this small piece of land they depend literally depend on that land for their food for the whole year and you know you have the dry season and people are really really struggling with that and you know you just have one hippo coming through it and destroy everything so it means they they lose out on their food they lose out on them any extra money that would have been used for school fees and that and what also we witnessed was you know the first time i went over there there were so many carcasses of hippos you know just and dried out there's a buffalo who was stuck in mud and there was a, a pod of hippos that was stuck in the mud with their baby they're trying to cover the baby from getting sunburned it was a really um distressing sight and i'm just going to show you um the picture right now so you can see this was part of the de devastation that was happening um so you can see there's a huge buffalo stuck over there um the carcasses this is a water hole that has completely dried out and this is happening because of the climate crisis you know these are people who have literally a negative carbon print and this is what's happening so the community doesn't live far from here it was really close but um the devastation is quite clear to see and we really tried our best to help so I'm going to show you the next picture that was our water truck and you know for the next 45 days we really tried our best to supply hay and you know put in water in the watering holes to avoid especially the communities from you know getting um, conflicts from wildlife in the surrounding area so it went on for 45 days and we worked with the rangers we worked with the community we worked with the wildlife service over there to do our very best to combat the crisis and another thing that we really faced was the lack of attention you know or even care from the local media we tried to contact them but all we got you know was after so much um communication was just a small column you know on the fifth page of a whole newspaper which meant that this crisis wasn't getting the attention it needed and um, we tried to contact several um medias international medias but even then it wasn't it was really difficult to you know to get um the world's attention to this crisis that was happening this is just another one you know this is just a dried out um water holes and you see you can see those footprints or is of a hippo that had tried to go in the into the middle of the water hole to, to try and get water but obviously everything's so dried out this was the one that really um broke my heart seeing this you know so we had our water trucks that were going every day to the designated spots to put in water and one day the rangers were going through and they just met a group of these girls who hadn't gone to school because the water holes near their homes had dried out so they had they skipped school so they could trek further away from their homes and this is through the bush you know and we have it's really risky because you know you don't know these wild animals are lurking around or you can even have militants who can come in and literally this is what's happening you know girls are missing out on school and the climate crisis is just not about water or isn't just not about floods it's a very um connected to gender issues like this where girls are literally missing out on school and it really breaks my heart because you know being a girl and having grown up in kenya i can see the difference an education can make in in a girl's life so seeing these things were very heartbreaking um, of course, you know, we, we, we filled the waters, the jerry cans were filled up and they were taken back home in the in the truck so that they could go back to school that day. But this is just a small one of the many um, incidences that are happening. And again, sadly, my country is suffering another devastating drought right now. Our wildlife again is dying. And um, it's it's very heartbreaking to see, especially with the leaders right now going on, you know, with the net zero carbon targets and, you know, with, with all this um, greenwashing, 
going on that they just want to continue with the extraction of fossil fuels when we are literally living our lives already um, ahead right now, especially in Kenya. You know, we are at the forefront of the climate crisis and, you know, you just have people at COP26 going around, you know, making all these empty promises. You know, we don't want any more promises. We want action and we want it now because, you know, all this, promises and promises that have been happening over so many years. And it's it's our people that are suffering. And again, it's coming down to our most vulnerable people of our society. So um, that's it for me for now. Just to give you an um, overview, eventually we did, the rain finally came, but it came after a long time and after a lot of suffering. So. You can read about all my accounts in the book for Arkbound uh, publications. And um, thank you so much for having me here. And uh, if you have anything, I look forward to connecting with all of you. So please do reach out to me if you have anything um, after this. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Fazila, for, for your story, uh, your very, very important story that brings a perspective that is, is very different and, and alien to us, to us here. Uh, but it's very, very important, and we are we are very honored to have you here today. The audience here, um, well, I cannot turn my camera now to to show you them, but um, you, you have you have people here listening to you and listening to to you on our website as well because we are streaming this. Um, so it's it's our great pleasure uh, to to share your your story uh, within Scan and here in Scotland. Um, thank you so much again, uh, Fazila, and we will move to Dr. Renuka Takore now uh, from Global Sustainable Futures. Uh, she will bring her own stories and experience from a research perspective. So we'll open the ground now to Dr. Takori. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. And thank you, Alex, uh, sorry, uh, Fazila, for uh, presenting your story. It's quite touching. and. I think we are co-authors of the same book. Yeah, so uh, this is the book. Uh, uh, so I, I will present uh, two perspectives here. I will present as an author of this, uh, one of the chapter of this book and also as a founder. And I will first go uh, through my, uh, Actually, I will first tell about my, as a founder. So, so I will play a video. It's just easy to tell my story there. Despite very significant development gains globally, which has raised many millions of people out of absolute poverty, there is substantial evidence that inequality between the world's richest and poorest countries is widening. Today the world has become more complex and poorer countries have experienced significant economic and social development. However, the inequalities within countries have also been growing and some commentators now talk of a global north and global south referring respectively to richer and poorer com communities which are found within and between countries. There are many causes of these inequalities, including the availability of natural resources, different levels of health and education, the nature of country's economy and its industrial sectors, international trading policies and access to markets, how countries are governed and international relationships between countries, conflict within and between countries, and a country's vulnerability to natural hazards and climate change. So most importantly, researchers are called upon to address the barriers to climate science in the global south. These culturally diverse nations of global south are united by common threats to their sustainable futures. 
challenges faced in creating collaborations, partnerships across national borders and academic disciplines. Through Global Sustainable Futures Progress Through Partnership Network, we want to play a leading role in creating an inclusive, collaborative, innovative and engaging platform for early career researchers and like-targeted stakeholders, including startups and entrepreneurs supported by experienced senior researchers and business leaders where everyone can share in their research, innovation, visualization and enthusiasm in parallel to network success. Our fundamental objective is to create a strong research environment building to a multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral team of endogenous professionals that would be capable of pursuing and utilizing participatory and integrative approaches in solving public and environmental sustainability problems. Therefore, our priorities are empowering and capacity building, working with researchers to empower communities and individuals, increase independence and support to those who need it, give researchers and stakeholders the legacy of sustainable, sustainable practices, fair and inclusive, improve economic and social and environmental equality, pursuing development which offers fair distribution and access to good quality life and working conditions. Networking and engagement provide an innovative and global wide platform to make global sustainable futures progress through partnership network, an effective and well-connected network transforming traditional society systems to more sustainable systems. And above all, it is sustainability. So co-create sustainable and resilient development pathways to secure sustainable futures for all and everyone. So the key focus is mobilization and engagement, building a community of practice, creating a strong leadership and producing a critical mass of good practices. 800 coordinators from 105 countries have joined me. So I also call upon you to join us and co-create sustainable futures together. So uh, that's the story and uh, my position as a founder of Global Sustainable Futures. And there's a big divide, as I mentioned, of Global South and Global North. And the early career researchers especially do not have any platform to go and they have lack of resources. And sometimes they are supported with resources, but still because of no experience of speaking or having no scopus publications, generally the traditional way of uh, identifying, uh, uh, you know, speakers and, uh, and uh, uh, researchers, they never get chance to speak in an international forum. They have innovative ideas. I think we have a lot to learn from the traditional and indigenous people who are working in local places because they know their local reality and their, their local problem and their local community. As well as researchers are looked upon something like special. A common community uh, never engage with researchers or researchers never take leadership to engage with community. That's uh, again, uh, even though we have many knowledgeable people within our community, uh, they have their own silo ways, you know, to tell their stories or, or to engage with other researchers rather than coming into community. So I think that there should be an engagement between the communities themselves, bringing all these together and uh, be respectful to each other and engage, uh, like exchange knowledge, especially scientific facts and not, not being uh, 
uh, you know, advertise and uh, not uh, having uh, your uh, uh, listening to rumors or myths. And that is a very big important part in climate change. So now I, as a researcher, I, I, I looked at uh, oceans in this uh, book chapter. And therefore I will uh, share just a few slides to uh, give you here a snapshot of what is happening. So this is the climate adaptation accounts of resilience, self-sufficiency and systems change a book, uh, which was edited by Artbound Foundation. And I'm very, very grateful that I got a chance to volunteer here as a co-author. Uh, they have definitely paid some of the authors, but I was not paid, but I was very grateful to them that I can voluntarily uh, contribute to such a nice cause. Um, and they are also startups and they too struggle with all these uh, resources and uh, things. So I think we have made a very good attempt to put this real uh, world scenario in front of people. Um, let me see if, yeah, okay. And here it is important that we talk about all these um, problems in the world, but also uh, present some solutions and especially from the systems thinking because uh, that is very important uh, underpinning theory or, or concept, which we need to understand that not uh, any system such as food, transport or housing are, are in silos. They work together. Uh, one has uh, any one change in one system has impact or multitude impacts on other systems. And therefore that is very important to uh, have this in mind. Uh, so uh, here, these are all our authors, uh, and I like this team. Uh, we are, I think, 20 of them who uh, engaged in this book. So here there are a few more, and they are from all over the world. So this is a, a worldwide attempt, I think, which made it possible for us to do this book. And all chapters, uh, as I mentioned, they were collated by Arcbound foundation and especially my chapter was third chapter uh, second chapter uh, but also the first chapter the first part uh, there are three parts and uh, 17 chapters in all these in this book and the first chapter uh, first part looks on the overview where we are and where we need to go and the situation of overview is this in chapter one is very, very nicely pre uh, presented by Steve McNaught, uh, Mary Saw, Margon Phillips, and Justin Steven. Though we can say that this is not a comprehensive picture, but it definitely shows, highlights the real problems coming up. And here, this ocean warming, acidification and deoxygenation, permafrost degradation and the extinctions of the species are the phenomena that are highly relevant to human societies and ecosystem integrity. And effectively, they are unreversible. And that is what we need to really understand that these phenomena are unreversible. And therefore we need to control them, adapt ourselves and uh, make resilient of uh, resilient and act towards diminishing their impact on the society. And going through climate change will have huge transformations, but also it will prepare societies to look in future and be prepared to address future problems. We don't know while we are addressing climate change, we, we don't know what future problems will be coming up. And therefore, we need to be very, very prepared. And this is uh, what it prepares us. And so the second chapter, Ocean in Peril, uh, per, uh, peril uh, the global state of ocean, I was joined by Dr. Jessica and Amle, um, sorry, Amle Kole. And what we are trying to here establish that ocean heating 
is the biggest problem. The ocean plays central part in our war. Uh, and as uh, 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 Fuzzy, uh, sorry, uh, what, what, what was the name of my previous author, uh, previous speaker, uh, Fazila. Fazila did mention about the drought and drought also uh, depends on ocean, uh, like evaporation and so on. And it has a, uh, uh, so, and though sea level is rising, but the ocean itself heating is rising and that has given us, like that has impacted many, many problems such as acidification and also on the aquatic life and low oxygen conditions and so on. And it is uh, just, um, uh, corals are being impacted and 50% uh, uh, of living coral has been extended. So these are the realities which we need to always keep in mind while we are dealing with uh, our societal problems. So, uh, and this is this, uh, while I won't not go too much in detail and take too much time here, I only wanted to know that what happens with the ocean that when the ice is melting, and here actually I would like to show you, uh, yes, when the ice is melting, uh, what happens, people look at opportunities rather than addressing it. And what has happened that the sea routes have now more developed to go into the polars and others. And that actually brings us more problem because we will be doing more fishing, more navigation, and that will be adding uh, carbon emissions there. And it will not reverse the process, but actually exaggerate the process. So what are the solutions? And here are some of the solutions like ocean iron fertilization and enhancing ocean uh, alkanity. I won't go into too many chemical and uh, processes, but I will stop here. So the story is here that uh, like, as Fazila said, droughts and the ocean, these all are interconnected. And you know that most urban uh, uh, population is uh, mostly situated at sea, uh, cities which are at uh, near sea or sea, uh, which are at coast levels. And so uh, these problems are increasing. And I think Global South uh, has to, is in a very, uh, uh, which uh, the condition that they are experiencing more impact while they have not contributed to the problem. And therefore uh, it is just like an unfair thing happening to them. And so uh, I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me this uh, time to present my uh, story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pranuka, for, for sharing your, your research uh, and your story um, with us. We are actually going to make uh, uh, a detour and to get here to Scotland. And maybe we'll have Solomon um, speaking at the end from the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. I uh, will pass the word now to uh, Alex McKenzie uh, from The Lost Woods. Uh, we screened a documentary uh, of the planting of the uh, Glasgow Children's Woodland yesterday, and we'll be screening it again today for those who haven't seen it. Um, and Alex is going to tell us about this, um, this community story, this uh, community climate action story with the children in Glasgow, very close to us. As, as part of, 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 of the solutions and what we can do within communities, in this case, in Scotland, to mitigate the, the negative impact of climate change, to educate children and to, to give them a, a hopeful uh, perspective on, on, on the future and a perspective of solidarity and action. So thank you so much, Alex. Um, thank you so much um, for inviting me along to this event. Um, it's, a, it's a great privilege to be here to tell our story um, about community action, but also to um, hear and witness some of the stories around the world as well with um, Fazella and Renuka and about their experiences too. So that is it's great to hear about that. Um, I was asked um, by SCAN 
Um, it was quite a poignant question. It was like, what does community climate action mean to me? And it gave me some pause for thought. Um, and what does it actually really mean to me? And a number of things kept firing up in my head about it. But if I was to distill it down to one thing, um, it would be that it's about keeping communities and people at the heart of the climate debate. Um, because without that focus, we won't possibly get to that greener, fairer future that we need to strive towards to. And it also, and I was even thinking about, it's about the kind of the reordering of power back into communities' hands so that their solutions are heard and their voices are heard. And it's about giving them power so that they're enabling to transform their communities for the better and their environments for the better. And it's also really critical in that conversation. It is about sharing the burden of the climate crisis equitably. It is not about um, the burden resting on the shoulders of those who can ill afford it, um, but it is about sharing that load um, because it shouldn't mean that we need lots of money to make green choices and to care for our planet. And I think what is most important and what I most love about community climate action, it's about what Greta Thunberg says to us, that no one is too small to make a difference. And collectively, when we come together as a community, then anything is possible. Which brings me to a story, because that's what started our project, was a story. So two years ago, I was reading a story to my young lassie, Ashling, who was seven years old. And it was a story in a book called Goodnight Stories to Rebel Girls. And it was a collection of inspirational stories from inspirational women from through the ages. And shamefully, I came across a story and it was about the Kenyan activist Wangari Maathai. And I hadn't heard about Wangari Maathai before. And it was only a short one page piece, but it blew me away because what it was, it was talking about Wangari Maathai setting up the Green Belt Movement. And it was so inspirational because it started with Kenyan village women facing all the effects of environmental degradation and deforestation and lakes and rivers drying out and having to walk miles and miles for firewood and governments cutting down trees to make room for farms. And their solution was that we need to bring the trees back. We need to bring the trees back to our lands. And when Gary Matai says, going to take a few million trees and the village was well that's impossible I mean there's no tree nursery there that would grow that many trees and she says we're not buying the trees we're going to grow them ourselves so they went into the forest they collected tree seeds they put them into tin cans they grew them in their backyards and when they were a foot tall they started planting them out and that movement, that simple, small, tiny, small action, that movement has grown into the Green Belt Movement, which has planted 51 million trees right across East Africa. And the killer punch for me was this tiny quote, a caption from Wangari Maathai, and it says, the time is now. And I thought, right, that's, and it haunted me. And it was, it was the spark that set off my journey and a journey of a group of volunteers in Glasgow to set up the Lost Woods project. Because what we thought would be, how wonderful would it be that each child in Glasgow had the opportunity to grow a tree from seed? You know, to have that and how experience all that wonderful learning that would bring when they have a slice of nature in their own hands, a very tangible, practical message for them about connecting to nature and to have that in their hands to learn about biodiversity, the growth of trees, the impact of trees within the ecosystem and to see that and how they could transform their wee environment for the better when they rewild their own city, which is 
nature deprived and in very urban deprived areas of, of Glasgow, that this tiny small action had the potential of rewilding their city for the better, particularly when they came together as a collective. So we've been working on that and engaging with 151 Glasgow primary schools right across the city. And in March 2020, just before lockdown, we distributed 50,000 Cecil acorns, oak acorns out to all the Glasgow primary schools before they went into lockdown. They had a single acorn to plant in a little biodegradable pot that they went home and they looked after all through lockdown. And then what is wonderful about the story is at the beginning of October this year, between the 4th and the 7th of October, we had a wee delegation for each of the Glasgow primary schools to come to a 13 hectare site to transform it into a Glasgow children's woodland, a woodland that will benefit everyone in the city that they could call their own. So each school had their own little plot, which was all connected to one another. And it was then planting in their little baby oak trees, some of which they had grown from a single acorn. And the power of that is, yes, you can, as one person, make a small action, but collectively we can make a big impact. And wouldn't that be just a wonderful legacy to have coming up to COP26? And that COP26 wasn't just being remembered about the traffic disruption and the inconvenience, but it was something grassroots coming up about children coming together to give a voice, their own voice, to what they want as a legacy for COP26. And it was a positive, hopeful message to bring forward. And that's what we had as our passion, because to bring it all back, this was about as that story from Wangari Matai, it is about empowerment. It is about no one's too small to make a difference. It's about a collective action. And it is about local people coming up with local solutions to, to make a, a good, wholesome local impact on their environment. I've got a short wee little video because it shouldn't be about my words. It should be the, word, the words of the children in Glasgow. My favourite thing about doing is this is that I'm helping our, my planet become healthier and helping Glasgow become a bit more eco-friendly. The animals help need our help and um, the world needs our help, so we're, so we're, we need to try and do the best as we can. It's for climate change and also it, it kind of helps us at the same time. Like trees help us breathe because they take in all the carbon dioxide. If nature does have any trees, um, we won't be able to breathe in there. We won't have air and all that. And it's really good to just see that the earth is getting better with the younger generation. It's a, just a short little clip. It's part of a whole um, documentary film. It's only a short film. It's 12 minutes long. And I know that has been shared at these events, but it just gives voice to the children and how they felt about the project and how, what they had to say about COP. And I think that's it's just a lovely, hopeful message that we can just be, and it's a little beacon of hope in Glasgow, what we're trying to do. But thank you for listening and thank you for listening about the story of the Lost Woods. Thank you so, so much, Alex. Uh, we are on a climate beacon here today as well. And uh, we, we, we are uh, glad um, as can and here with the National Mining Museum to, to illuminate the stories. And in my opinion, this is a, an amazing story of learning from indigenous knowledge, uh, what, what you just shared. And this, this conversations that we, that we want to have and to keep adding layers, like I'm sure everybody here today and the people who are watching us at home will, will have some ideas of their own today. Um, and they can get in touch with, with our speakers, of course, to keep discussing this. Um, we'll keep on Scotland now because uh, we lost Solomon again. We might not have him. If we don't have him, we'll still have him on film. So I'm going to pass the word now to Pat. Hello, I, I'm Pat Abel. Uh, I'm on the board of SCAN but also Chair of Transition Edinburgh South um, since 2009. In 2014, we actually got access to a walled garden. We got access to a walled garden at Gracemount, which is a, a very, uh, I think, one of the highest deprived areas in Edinburgh. Um, and we had climate challenge funding. So we um, really had it completely wild. 
So we started with veg and fruit. Um, unfortunately discovered the veg side had um, eight inches of shale because it had been a tennis court just under the grass. So we thought it was brilliant. So we had to start and think again about that. I think we did, initially we followed Charles Bowding's way of uh, gardening, which is organic and um, as, well, as little disturbance to the soil as possible. Um, then next door to us were, was Grace Mount Primary School. So they didn't even have to go across a road, they were right beside us. And I think from listening to Alex, what was really interesting was we were very lucky the head teacher had read the book, The Last Child in the Woods, and the impact of, on our children of what that means. I think that this was one of the things that we were really lucky with because he's very much been a supporter of the garden. In fact, last week he said, I think it's ours. Um, so fine, um, which is great. Um, and we are, we've got some really good sort of initiatives with them. Some of the teachers, obviously, when we started, were actually very nervous for the simple reason that they themselves were not used to being in a, a space, a natural space. And so to take 30 children out into a natural space was quite hard. Um, most of them are really great now and quite happy with it. And we have not sort of worked with that and we've had some really interesting sort of experiences. We had, and I think, we want to see um, nature as a core for the core curriculum. It's really got to come that way, but having said that, people get very nervous about that. But we've had one of the first teachers, I think it was primary five, suddenly got her children to start to create little doors. And then they planted them, we've got woodland around our mansion as well, and they planted them in the woodland. And then they took out primary twos. And they'd created a story around each of those doors. And they told the story to the primary twos. And you start to see in the maths class come out and use the garden to teach maths. So it's trying to understand how nature can be part of that. Um, one little girl came up, we have a gardener who works, he was working a lot more for us, but with uh, COVID he's been working a little a day a week, which is not so good but we look as if we're getting that built up again. But this little girl came up with a, um, a, a what in the word, that's terrible, um, the caterpillar. And the gardener said, well, it's not actually a moth, a butterfly, it's a moth, the cinnabar moth. And the little girl said, all oh, right, well, what do I do with this caterpillar? Well, the cinnabar moth only eats the ragwort, the yellow plant over there. The only one it eats. But little incidents like that, you think that child holds on to that. It's, you know, an instance in understanding that nature is a lot more complicated than we understand. It is actually a lot more complicated if you find out that ragwort, if they've eaten all of the leaves, they actually can get something in to cope with. The, the cinnabar moth, and you think, well, that's nice. But that's what we forget. We always want to do things ourselves in nature. And I think that's something that we have to learn. So we moved to regenerative horticulture at some point, and that's very much about organic and not digging and starting to understand um, more about diversity and covered crops. Um, we all have heard about how many harvests we've got left. People start to say there's 40. What we forget to ask is, so what's the implications for now? And this is where you suddenly find, I went to, a, I think the Queen's Hall and there was a storyteller there. And she was saying that basically in 1951, the, the carotene, the carrot, if you want to, eat and get the same nutrition now as you got then, you'd have to eat five carrots. And so you get people saying, we're supposed to eat five a day, that's 25 vegetables a day. Isn't it better if we start to build the soil up again? Um, how much we completely build it up because we've lost a lot of the topsoil, which is part of this rock. Um, 
we have, there's can put what they call canic crop gas. So we've got an understanding of that. And our cultivated soils apparently have lost 50 to 70% of their original carbon content. So we can start to grow plants because through photosynthesis like trees, they take the carbon in and uh, the carbon dioxide in and give out oxygen so for us to breathe, which is nice. Um, so I think that we have got to really look at this. Um, and I saw in, in reading other books on that. And so there's no need for fertilizers because they create sugars, plants create sugars that they then give out to the microbes and the microbes will actually bring back the um, food that the plant needs to grow. Um, so healthy soil is something that we really want to get hold of, create. Um, what we have to realize too is it can also work, reduce flooding and drought because flooding is, um, it holds the, the water into the soil. So we need to actually start to create as much space for good healthy soil as we can. Um, so under, well, it acts as a giant monster holding sponge, apparently, is what we've got around here. Um, because compacted soil is with problems. So you get greater availability of nutrients, you start to cope with the um, flooding and the um, drought, and take in more of the greenhouse gases. So we've got a lot to be thankful for if we start to build up our soils. Um, and if you have a garden, please start growing some of your own veg and stuff in it. Um, and you know, try and practice um, no dig and no bear earth. And I've got to say, it's a learning experience. Certainly once you get into diversity, I've got uh, something that say, says that American farmers, one of the things that they have problems with is getting good food. And uh, whether they're, I have no idea if they're maybe growing wheat or uh, animals or what, or if they are um, industrial farmers, but somebody has put together a seed, which is about a dozen different vegetable seeds. And this is what they're using in their hopper and putting in. And of course that goes against our idea of nice neat roads. Um, so we are going to experiment with that. or we'll start to talk about that this next year. What's the equivalent for Scotland? We've got one guy who has just written a book, um, Alan Fleck Carter, and he does, he's sort of towards, there's a forest garden he wants to create in Aberdeen. For permaculture, you've got Martin Crawford, uh, and down in Devon, it's not quite the same as Aberdeen. So I'd be interested to see if he would give us a dozen sorts of seeds that he thinks we could put together and go um, try to work with our soil. So that's one of the things. The other person that's really interesting, well, two or three people are interesting. Christine Jones, who's a top um, soil biologist in Australia, she helped uh, pasture, um, somebody with a pasture for animals, and um, she helped him plant a very diverse grass seed. And they went back seven to nine months later, and the farmer dug 100 holes. And he said, it's the same everywhere. I've got five inches of soil I didn't have. So, and an interesting thing with her, it wasn't that video itself. She suddenly said, and by the way, we ourselves, our microbiome requires 30 different plant foods a week. Um, so there's a lot to start to think about with that. Um, but uh, Stefano Mancusa, who's our, our leading expert in plant neurobiology, wrote a book called the, the Nature, The Nation of Plants. He wrote it from the point of view of being a plant. He, he put together a constitution about plants. And they're saying, fill your cities with plants because if we know how to cope with carbon dioxide and pollution, and we can do it very quickly. And that's interesting because he is named by the New Yorker as um, somebody who's a change maker. And I think this is the sort of thing that we have to look for. But when we tried to get more climate challenge funding for the fact that we were eventually getting a state of carbon sequestration, we never got it. I don't think they'd calculated how to calculate carbon sequestration. Um, 
And I think that's one of the problems that we've got at the moment. Mm. Having said that, this week I was at the Cross Party and Food in Scotland, mm. and it was um, somebody who was talking about Scottish meat, saying how marvellous it was in comparison with most others. Um, and well, in some ways they're right. You know, we haven't got cafos, we haven't got, you know. And um, they also were sort of saying that we've got to start to, um, sorry, I've lost my part there. Um, so we've got, really got to start and think about that. Um, the other thing that I was quite surprised at I watched a, a Zoom a couple of weeks ago, and it was talking very, well, it was talking about 15 minute neighborhoods. And I, I think the academic said, I don't believe in this. I don't think we can do this. this. And he used as an instance, Richard could do it, but where else can you do it? But actually, I think the conversation about trying to get food into a 15 minute neighborhood, we in Grace Mount are down as a food desert. And Actually, if you start to talk about how you do get fresh local food into there, somebody starts to say that, well, there used to be vans that took things around. So there are ways of maybe dealing with it. It may be not quite your nice, con neat con way, but I think there's things that we could actually do and make a difference um, to the diets of people in those uh, areas. So I think um, we've got a lot and sorry, I was briefly saying about the cross party and food that was where I was talking. And it was the meat, and it was the Scottish wholesaler as well, as to how they get it out in their supply chains and how they hate the fact that quite often their vans come back empty. And then we had Abby Morton from the Glasgow Food City Plan, and it was something that I thought that's great to hear that because she kept using the word regenerative. And I thought to get that at a national level is fantastic. Um, so hopefully we are in a stage where we can start to not apologize for using these words and why we think it's such a, a good way to go. Um, obviously, whether it's all annuals or whether it's perennials, because obviously moving towards permaculture and uh, is, is something at some stage. But to get over to people in a lot what's another the idea of that is a lot bigger than getting over the idea of regenerative. Um, so I think we are into a new era, hopefully. Um, and um, I'm going to be, we're starting to talk to a group in Aberdeen who have called their, their one seat forward. They also call themselves garden schools. And I like that word, those words. I thought if we can start to get garden schools, and that's your key thing. We, we're, we've got the primary school ever since COVID, every class in the primary is in the garden every week. Um, obviously, we'd like more, um, but that's down to having a gardener so much shorter, but we're, we're, our funding is going up. And um, we also helped high school, high school to start a garden as well last year. And we are working with them this year. Um, so senior one and senior two have got the option of getting out into the garden. Um, I think education is such a big part of it. I'm hoping that I can speak to Abby Morden because Glasgow are talking about education as part of their Fruit City plan. And if we can get maybe Aberdeen and Edinburgh and um, Glasgow starting to look, hopefully there is something more positive um, and, and recognizing that um, we can get a bit more in, nutrients into our food than we've had in the past. Very much. It's been interest, really interesting to hear all the different people. I, I took somebody from Kenya around years ago, um, one of the gardens I was work, working in. And there is so much that we just, you could say we've got to be lucky, but if our soils aren't sorted soon, we've got a lot of problems as well. Anyway, so um, this is the end of our panel. Unfortunately, we won't have Solomon with us today. He's having connectivity issues. We're gonna to listen to his story on the films later. Uh, we still have some time, thankfully, uh, to have for questions to, to our panel. Um, hello, I have a question for you, Vasila. 
when the when the rains came after such a long drought, uh, what happened? Um, were those rains very very heavy, or did the did the rain cause more problems when they, it started to rain, or or was it less rain? Or uh, I was just interested to know what, what happens after a drought when you have a lot of rain. Yeah. So you know when the rains came, it it um, it started with a few drizzles, but then they weren't helping much of the situation. But it came, it was heavy rain, and it was such a relief because all the water holes were now full of water. The birds came back, and you know, just within two or three days, it was an oasis. That was that went on for that year, it was okay. But then um, you know, after two or three years, we had flooding again, it was it became it was massive flooding. And um, sadly, it meant again, you know, the same cycle came in when we had crops were ruined. And again, um, we, we started having locust invasions, which was, it's been really um, devastating as well. And yet again, now we're going through drought. So it's just a continuous cycle of devastation. It's because when you start to talk about drought, then there's all, this, all the, the, co the connections between what else happens after when it floods? Oh, it's yeah. um, it's an incredible cycle. Well, thank thank you. Um, well, for for your story, um, and thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Hi, uh, I've got a question regarding uh, culture. Um, so I'm interested in the the book that was discussed this morning, and I just wondered if Renuka and Fazila have any experience working with cultural organisations to try and instigate change. See how, because we at the Mining Museum want to take this um, really seriously and we're looking at different strategies of how we can really take hold of this subject and, and drive it forward as an organization. Uh, thank you, uh, very nice question on culture. culture. You know, we are traditionally uh, embedded in our culture. Uh, especially like uh, developed countries are having a culture of many things, but wasteful society as well. And also um, um, because, and we cannot think that if it is a poor society, it does not have environmental impact. So that is also one type of cultural thing that we feel that, okay, because they do not have resources, they might not be wasting resources and therefore they are more sustainable. I think what is stereotype of our culture that we have been always looking at safety, security, but also from the economical point of view. And therefore changing our cultural perspective is very, very important and how we can induce this. We have tried different framings like from my research point of view, and I'm, I might be speaking more, uh, you know, academic language uh, because I, I'm used to those languages, but I'm really sorry, I won't be able to put in a common context. Uh, but definitely what we have seen that people always think about economic, uh, economies first. And we think that if we are economically stable, then we will have, we will be able to do something better or sustainable for the society and what i think that we should have a mind of sustainability that is multi-dimensional do not think only of economic uh, profits if you are doing something that is better for the society you will definitely get the impacts on economic social and all those will be positive impact and so never think from one side to other, but always think an overall benefit to impact on different benefits. And that is what we want to need to bring as a cultural change. Uh, if we are doing one activity, always think that how it, it, it will multitudely impact on different activities, even if they are at a distance place, uh, at your, uh, uh, you know, within your family, within your neighborhood, within your nation and within your global environment. And I think we have to have a broad perspective and that is what everyone need to be looking at. I will stop there. I, I, I think I'm more a bit uh, academic here, sorry. 
I'm delighted at what you said. Uh, I'm the chief exec here at the Mining Museum, and one of the things that we talk about in terms of sustainability across the sector is always about economic. And I've always pressed the point that it's much, much wider than that. So I'm delighted to hear what you said. It's definitely a message I think needs to get shared much, much more and understood much, much more. So thank you very much for that comment. Yeah, from my experiences, um, you know, having um, interacted with so many communities and especially gotten to know the indigenous way of life, I would say that culture is one that we should all look into and, you know, draw upon every day because they've lived in harmony with nature for like hundreds of years. Um, their carbon print is literally negative. And, um, you know, some of their practices, you know, they, they lived in areas that wasn't prone to so many conflicts or they knew the weather patterns so well that they could even predict their droughts, which now is becoming very difficult. So maybe we should look into those practices and try and replicate them as, as we look into you know, climate mitigation as well. And also we need to look at the spiritual um, practices as well, because they're very spiritual and they have very little, um, they don't attach a lot of um, importance to material things. So definitely that's something that we can all draw on as we go on, you know, to mitigate the climate crisis that's happening, thanks. I can just add something on Alex Woodlands. Uh, I'm fascinated with that idea, and especially uh, there is, uh, I would like to draw your attention uh, to one uh, movement which was started in Brazil by one of my coordinator in Brazil, and he has spent his own time and his family resources to go to the schools and engage uh, uh, students from eight years to 15 years in uh, planting, wood planting or gardening, you can say, and how to engage the students with nature. And as you said, it is a very good educational practice. Actually, I am doing a research which is called STRIDES, and it is strategic uh, tri-level interventions for drivers for education for sustainability. And here we are trying to actually only identify the state of art of education system and how we can deliver excellence in education. And what I mean by education, it's not only the formal system of education, but also informal. This exchange which we are doing today is also an education between us. Exchange knowledge is an education. Talking to family, talking to children is also an education. And how we can bring this excellence, this education part of our uh, communication, you can say. And what we have found that in, uh, embedding, or you can say integrating, what's the word? Integrating environmental education with any sort of uh, main discipline help students to engage with nature and bring up the solutions which are nature-based or at least having a less impact on nature. And we are now doing eight publications actually, and probably you will be uh, uh, attracted to one, one of those, which is having educational, uh, sorry, environmental sustainability as an education system. However, I do not say that everything can be done, but I have seen the linkages. Like, for example, if we are talking about geography, we have always to, uh, spoken about topography, soil, and everything, but we haven't made a connection of those to the plants or the connection of those to the flora and fauna uh, cycle as well as to the food cycle, we know that there is a connection, but we all work in silos and we haven't made those connections to society and bring those uh, learnings in a simple way to the society so that they can also learn that this is our local soil and this can be uh, more uh, you know, uh, sustainable for our soil and our society and, uh, and also including our uh, like maintaining our cultural, uh, traditional and other things as well. 
And those linkages are very, very important for us who know to bring to the public. And therefore, a lot of communication is needed and a lot of right way of communication is needed and excellence in that is needed. How you put out to the public is needed and so on. And so, yeah, uh, thank you for telling your story. And uh, as I said, the movement is uh, going on in 144 countries and they have be, you can Google also probably, I, I, I might be able to find out the exact name of that movement and send you, but that is really, really a good movement, you know? However, we have a, we know that this is good. We haven't made a, a substantial impact in our uh, uh, society to bring up as many trees as we want. Uh, but it is really a good try, a good a good uh, way to move forward. Hi, everyone, thank you so much for all your um, really powerful stories from around the world. I guess I have a, a question that came to mind when I was listening to Fazila talk about how your initial um, interactions with the conservation organizations weren't helpful because of the racism within conservation, which is kind of widely discussed um, now and obviously has been around for a lot longer, but is much more of a discussion point now. So it really showed to me the dangers of not including community voices in the big decisions that are being made at the moment um, at COP. So I wondered if, if you had ideas about how we can sustain attention for communities beyond the big event like COP at the moment focuses our minds much more, but how do we sustain that? Is there roles for media, um, if schools and education we've discussed, but maybe you have some other ideas. So for, I guess for Fazila, but for, for everybody to, to maybe help us think about how to sustain attention for community level. I think it's the way that we interact with people as well, because um, what's happening right now, even with the media, I've been to protests, you know, where my picture has been conveniently cropped out. And, you know, my other friend who was wearing a hijab as well, because it just doesn't fit the narrative. Um, even when it comes down to the media, even our very local on media in Kenya, when it comes to reporting to communities, there's, um, especially in rural areas, there's hardly any attention given to them. So we need to change the structures. We need to start, you know, people already have their voices. They've been screaming and shouting, you know, for the last decades that, they, that they're here. We need to give them that platform. The mic needs to be passed on to these communities. You know, sadly, it's, it's not, even when we have um, strikes happening in Kenya, the attention all goes to Nairobi. You know, we have, uh, even though we have strikes in Voi, we have strikes in Mombasa, we have strikes in other rural areas, but the attention only goes to Nairobi. And it being a city, it, we do have effects of climate change, but it's not as drastic as rural areas. So, you know, I'm just calling out, you know, if you're in a place of position and if you have a platform, you know, please pass the mic over to other communities that are disadvantaged and let them come to the podium and share their own experiences and be an ally as well. So that, that's what I have to say. Thank you for your question and highlighting it as well. That's a really important thing as well, thanks. Thank you so much uh, for, for, for being here today to all the speakers, Fazila, Dr. Renuka, Alex, Pat. Um, it was a true honor from, from SCAN to, to welcome you here today and your stories. And we hope to keep sharing the stories recorded here today, but also keep growing our, our network and keep, um, we are growing, of course, a, a network of uh, forest communities, but also international communities and how we can learn um, from each other. Uh, I think all of you saw my face. I think Fazila didn't see my face, so I'm just gonna <laughs> put this down so I can give you a smile. <laughs> um, thank you so much again for being here today. And I wish you uh, a great day. Uh, I'm going to try and turn the computer without. Uh... Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much, uh, Joanna. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>